King David grew old. The years had caught up with him. Even though they piled blankets on him, he couldn't keep warm. So his servants said to him, We're going to get a young virgin for our master the king to be at his side and look after him, she'll get in bed with you and arouse our master the king. So they searched the country of Israel for the most ravishing girl they could find, they found Abishag the Shunammite and brought her to the king. The girl was stunningly beautiful, she stayed at his side and looked after the king, but the king did not have sex with her. At this time Adonijah, whose mother was Haggith, puffed himself up saying, I'm the next king. He made quite a splash, with chariots and riders and fifty men to run ahead of him. His father had spoiled him rotten as a child, never once reprimanding him. Besides that, he was very good looking and the next in line after Absalom. Adonijah talked with Joab son of Zeruiah and with Abiathar the priest, and they threw their weight on his side. But neither the priest Zadok, nor Benaiah son of Jehoiada, nor Nathan the prophet, nor Shimei and Ray, nor David's personal bodyguards supported Adonijah. Next Adonijah held a coronation feast, sacrificing sheep, cattle, and grain-fed heifers at the stone of Zoheleth near the Rogal Spring. He invited all his brothers, the king's sons, and everyone in Judah who had position and influence, but he did not invite the prophet Nathan, Benaiah, the bodyguards, or his brother Solomon. Nathan went to Bathsheba, Solomon's mother, did you know that Adonijah, Haggatha's son, has taken over as king, and our master David doesn't know a thing about it? Quickly now, let me tell you how you can save both your own life and Solomon's. Go immediately to King David. Speak up, didn't you, my master the king, promise me, your son Solomon will be king after me and sit on my throne. So why is Adonijah now king? While you're there talking with the king, I'll come in and corroborate your story. Bathsheba went at once to the king in his palace bedroom. He was so old. Abishag was at his side making him comfortable. As Bathsheba bowed low, honoring the king, he said, what do you want? My master, she said, you promised me in God's name, your son Solomon will be king after me and sit on my throne. And now look what's happened, Adonijah has taken over as king, and my master the king doesn't even know it. He has thrown a huge coronation feast, cattle and grain-fed heifers and sheep, inviting all the king's sons, the priest Abiathar, and Joab head of the army. But your servant Solomon was not invited. My master the king, every eye in Israel is watching you to see what you'll do, to see who will sit on the throne of my master the king after him. If you fail to act, the moment you're buried my son Solomon and I are as good as dead. Abruptly, while she was telling the king all this, Nathan the prophet came in and was announced, Nathan the prophet is here. He came before the king, honoring him by bowing deeply, his face touching the ground. My master the king, Nathan began, did you say, Adonijah shall be king after me and sit on my throne? Because that's what's happening. He's thrown a huge coronation feast, cattle, grain-fed heifers, sheep, inviting all the king's sons, the army officers, and Abiathar the priest. They're having a grand time, eating and drinking and shouting, long live King Adonijah. But I wasn't invited, nor was the priest Zadok, nor Benaiah son of Jehoiada, nor your servant Solomon. Is this something that my master the king has done behind our backs, not telling your servants who you intended to be king after you? King David took action, get Bathsheba back in here. She entered and stood before the king. The king solemnly promised, as God lives, 
the God who delivered me from every kind of trouble, I'll do exactly what I promised in God's name, the God of Israel, your son Solomon will be king after me and take my place on the throne. And I'll make sure it happens this very day. Bathsheba bowed low, her face to the ground. Kneeling in reverence before the king she said, Oh, may my master, King David, live forever. King David said, Call Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, and Benaiah son of Jehoiada. They came to the king. Then he ordered, Gather my servants, then mount my son Solomon on my royal mule and lead him in procession down to Gion. When you get there, Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet will anoint him king over Israel. Then blow the ram's horn trumpet and shout, Long life King Solomon! You will then accompany him as he enters and takes his place on my throne, succeeding me as king. I have named him ruler over Israel and Judah. Benaiah son of Jehoiada backed the king, yes. And may God, the God of my master the king, confirm it. Just as God has been with my master the king, may he also be with Solomon and make his rule even greater than that of my master King David. Then Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, Benaiah son of Jehoiada, and the king's personal bodyguard, the Carathites and Pelathites, went down, mounted Solomon on King David's mule, and paraded with him to Gion. Zadok the priest brought a flask of oil from the sanctuary and anointed Solomon. They blew the ram's horn trumpet and everyone shouted, Long live King Solomon! Everyone joined the fanfare, the band playing and the people singing, the very earth reverberating to the sound. Adonijah and his retinue of guests were just finishing their coronation feast when they heard it. When Joab heard the blast of the ram's horn trumpet he said, What's going on here? What's all this uproar? Suddenly, in the midst of the questioning, Jonathan son of Abiathar the priest, showed up. Adonijah said, Welcome. A brave and good man like you must have good news. But Jonathan answered, Hardly. Our master King David has just made Solomon king. And the king has surrounded him with Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, Benaiah son of Jehoiada, with the Carathites and Pelathites, and they've mounted Solomon on the royal mule. Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet have anointed him king at Gion and the parade is headed up this way singing, a great fanfare. The city is beside itself. That's what you're hearing. Here's the crowning touch, Solomon is seated on the throne of the kingdom. And that's not all, the king's servants have come to give their blessing to our master King David saying, God make Solomon's name even more honored than yours, and make his rule greater than yours. On his deathbed the king worshipped God and prayed, Blessed be God, Israel's God, who has provided a successor to my throne, and I've lived to see it. Panicked, Adonijah's guests got out of there, scattering every which way. But Adonijah himself, afraid for his life because of Solomon, fled to the sanctuary and grabbed the horns of the altar. Solomon was told, Adonijah, fearful of King Solomon, has taken sanctuary and seized the horns of the altar and is saying, I'm not leaving until King Solomon promises that he won't kill me. Solomon then said, If he proves to be a man of honor, not a hair of his head will be hurt but if there is evil in him, he'll die. Solomon summoned him and they brought him from the altar. Adonijah came and bowed down, honoring the king. Solomon dismissed him, go home. When David's time to die approached, he charged his son Solomon, saying, I'm about to go the way of all the earth, but you, be strong, show what you're made of. Do what God tells you. Walk in the paths he shows you, follow the life map absolutely, 
keep an eye out for the signposts, his course for life set out in the revelation to Moses, then you'll get on well in whatever you do and wherever you go. Then God will confirm what he promised me when he said, If your sons watch their step, staying true to me heart and soul, you'll always have a successor on Israel's throne. And don't forget what Joab son of Zeruiah did to the two commanders of Israel's army, to Abner son of Nat and to Amasa son of Jether. He murdered them in cold blood, acting in peacetime as if he were at war, and has been stained with that blood ever since. Do what you think best with him, but by no means let him get off scot-free, make him pay. But be generous to the sons of Barzillai the Gileadite, extend every hospitality to them, that's the way they treated me when I was running for my life from Absalom your brother. You also will have to deal with Shimi son of Gera the Benjaminite from Bahurim, the one who cursed me so viciously when I was on my way to Mahanaim. Later, when he welcomed me back at the Jordan, I promised him under God, I won't put you to death. But neither should you treat him as if nothing ever happened. You're wise, you know how to handle these things. You'll know what to do to make him pay before he dies. Then David joined his ancestors. He was buried in the city of David. David ruled Israel for forty years, seven years in Hebron and another thirty-three in Jerusalem. Solomon took over on the throne of his father David, he had a firm grip on the kingdom. Adonijah son of Haggith came to Bathsheba, Solomon's mother. She said, Do you come in peace? He said, In peace. And then, may I say something to you? Go ahead, she said, speak. You know that I had the kingdom right in my hands and everyone expected me to be king, and then the whole thing backfired and the kingdom landed in my brother's lap, God's doing. So now I have one request to ask of you, please don't refuse me. Go ahead, ask she said. Ask King Solomon, he won't turn you down, to give me Abishag the Shunammite as my wife. Certainly, said Bathsheba. I'll speak to the king for you. Bathsheba went to King Solomon to present Adonijah's request. The king got up and welcomed her, bowing respectfully, and returned to his throne. Then he had a throne put in place for his mother, and she sat at his right hand. She said, I have a small favor to ask of you. Don't refuse me. The king replied, Go ahead, mother, of course I won't refuse you. She said, Give Abishag the Shunammite to your brother Adonijah as his wife. King Solomon answered his mother, What kind of favor is this? asking that Abishag the Shunammite be given to Adonijah. Why don't you just ask me to hand over the whole kingdom to him on a platter since he is my older brother and has Abiathar the priest and Joab son of Zeruiah on his side. Then King Solomon swore under God, May God do his worst to me if Adonijah doesn't pay for this with his life. As surely as God lives, the God who has set me firmly on the throne of my father David and has put me in charge of the kingdom just as he promised, Adonijah will die for this, today. Solomon arranged a marriage contract with Pharaoh, king of Egypt. He married Pharaoh's daughter and brought her to the city of David until he had completed building his royal palace and God's temple and the wall around Jerusalem. Meanwhile, the people were worshipping at local shrines because at that time no temple had yet been built to the name of God. Solomon loved God and continued to live in the God-honoring ways of David his father, except that he also worshipped at the local shrines, offering sacrifices and burning incense. The king went to Gibeon, the most prestigious of the local shrines, to worship. He sacrificed a thousand whole burnt offerings on that altar. That night, there in Gibeon, 
God appeared to Solomon in a dream, God said, What can I give you? Ask. Solomon said, You were extravagantly generous in love with David my father, and he lived faithfully in your presence, his relationships were just and his heart right. And you have persisted in this great and generous love by giving him, and this very day, a son to sit on his throne. And now here I am, God, my God, you have made me, your servant, ruler of the kingdom in place of David my father. I'm too young for this, a mere child. I don't know the ropes, hardly know the ins and outs of this job. And here I am, set down in the middle of the people you've chosen, a great people, far too many to ever count. Here's what I want, give me a God-listening heart so I can lead your people well, discerning the difference between good and evil. For who on their own is capable of leading your glorious people? God, the Master, was delighted with Solomon's response. And God said to him, Because you have asked for this and haven't grasped after a long life, or riches, or the doom of your enemies, but you have asked for the ability to lead and govern well, I'll give you what you've asked for, I'm giving you a wise and mature heart. There's never been one like you before, and there'll be no one after. As a bonus, I'm giving you both the wealth and glory you didn't ask for, there's not a king anywhere who will come up to your mark. And if you stay on course, keeping your eye on the life map and the God signs as your father David did, I'll also give you a long life. Solomon woke up, what a dream. He returned to Jerusalem, took his place before the chest of the covenant of God, and worshipped by sacrificing whole burnt offerings and peace offerings. Then he laid out a banquet for everyone in his service. The very next thing, two prostitutes showed up before the king. The one woman said, My master, this woman and I live in the same house. While we were living together, I had a baby. Three days after I gave birth, this woman also had a baby. We were alone, there wasn't anyone else in the house except for the two of us. The infant son of this woman died one night when she rolled over on him in her sleep. She got up in the middle of the night and took my son, I was sound asleep, mind you, and put him at her breast and put her dead son at my breast. When I got up in the morning to nurse my son, here was this dead baby. But when I looked at him in the morning light, I saw immediately that he wasn't my baby. Not so, said the other woman. The living one's mine, the dead one's yours. The first woman countered, no. Your son's the dead one, mine's the living one. They went back and forth this way in front of the king. The king said, what are we to do? This woman says, The living son is mine and the dead one is yours, and this woman says, No, the dead one's yours and the living one's mine. After a moment the king said, Bring me a sword. They brought the sword to the king. Then he said, Cut the living baby in two, give half to one and half to the other. The real mother of the living baby was overcome with emotion for her son and said, Oh no, master. Give her the whole baby alive, don't kill him. But the other one said, If I can't have him, you can't have him, cut away. The king gave his decision, Give the living baby to the first woman. Nobody is going to kill this baby. She is the real mother. The word got around, everyone in Israel heard of the king's judgment. They were all in awe of the king, realizing that it was God's wisdom that enabled him to judge truly. King Solomon was off to a good start ruling Israel. These were the leaders in his government. Azariah son of Zadok, the priest. Elahoraph and Ahijah, sons of Shisha, secretaries. 
Jehoshaphat son of Ahalud, historian. Benaiah son of Jehoiada, commander of the army. Zadok and Abiathar, priests. Azariah son of Nathan, in charge of the regional managers. Zebud son of Nathan, priest and friend to the king. Ahishar, manager of the palace. Adoniram son of Abda, manager of the slave labor. Solomon had twelve regional managers distributed throughout Israel. They were responsible for supplying provisions for the king and his administration. Each was in charge of bringing supplies for one month of the year. These are the names. Ben-Hur in the Ephraim Hills. Ben-Dikur in Makaz, Shalbim, Beth Shemesh, and Elon Beth Hanan. Ben Hezd in Araboth, this included Soko and all of Hefer. Ben Abinadab in Naphot Dor, he was married to Solomon's daughter Taphath. Bana son of Ahalud in Tanakh and Megiddo, all of Beth Shan next to Zarethan below Jezreel, and from Beth Shan to Abel Mehola over to Jachmim. Ben Jeber in Ramoth Gilead, this included the villages of Jair son of Manasseh in Gilead and the region of Argob in Bashan with its sixty large walled cities with bronze-studded gates. Ahinadab son of Ido in Mahanaim. Ahamaz in Naphtali, he was married to Solomon's daughter Basemath. Bana son of Hushai in Asher and Alaph. Jehoshaphat son of Peruah in Issachar. Shimi son of Ella in Benjamin. Jeber son of Uri in Gilead, this was the country of Sion king of the Amorites and also of Og king of Bashan, he managed the whole district by himself. Judah and Israel were densely populated, like sand on an ocean beach. All their needs were met, they ate and drank and were happy. Solomon was sovereign over all the kingdoms from the river Euphrates in the east to the country of the Philistines in the west, all the way to the border of Egypt. They brought tribute and were vassals of Solomon all his life. One day's food supply for Solomon's household was 0.185 bushels of fine flour 0.375 bushels of meal 0.10 grain-fed cattle 0.20 range cattle 0.100 sheep and miscellaneous deer, gazelles, roebucks, and choice fowl. Solomon was sovereign over everything, countries and kings, west of the river Euphrates from Tifsa to Gaza. Peace reigned everywhere. Throughout Solomon's life, everyone in Israel and Judah lived safe and sound, all of them from Dan in the north to Beersheba in the south, content with what they had. Solomon had 40,000 stalls for chariot horses and 12,000 horsemen. The district managers, each according to his assigned month, delivered food supplies for King Solomon and all who sat at the king's table, there was always plenty. They also brought to the designated place their assigned quota of barley and straw for the horses. God gave Solomon wisdom, the deepest of understanding and the largest of hearts. There was nothing beyond him, nothing he couldn't handle. Solomon's wisdom outclassed the vaunted wisdom of wise men of the East, outshone the famous wisdom of Egypt. He was wiser than anyone, wiser than Ethan the Ezraite, wiser than Heman, wiser than Calcol and Darda the sons of Mahal. He became famous among all the surrounding nations. He created 3,000 proverbs, his songs added up to 1,005. He knew all about plants, from the huge cedar that grows in Lebanon to the tiny hyssop that grows in the cracks of a wall. He understood everything about animals and birds, reptiles and fish. Sent by kings from all over the earth who had heard of his reputation, people came from far and near to listen to the wisdom of Solomon. 
Hiram king of Tyre sent ambassadors to Solomon when he heard that he had been crowned king in David's place. Hiram had loved David his whole life. Solomon responded, saying, You know that David my father was not able to build a temple in honor of God because of the wars he had to fight on all sides, until God finally put them down. But now God has provided peace all around, no one against us, nothing at odds with us. Now here is what I want to do, build a temple in honor of God, my God, following the promise that God gave to David my father, namely, your son whom I will provide to succeed you as king, he will build a house in my honor. And here is how you can help, give orders for cedars to be cut from the Lebanon forest, my loggers will work alongside yours and I'll pay your men whatever wage you set. We both know that there is no one like you Sidonians for cutting timber. When Hiram got Solomon's message, he was delighted, exclaiming, Blessed be God for giving David such a wise son to rule this flourishing people. Then he sent this message to Solomon, I received your request for the cedars and cypresses. It's as good as done, your wish is my command. My lumberjacks will haul the timbers from the Lebanon forest to the sea, assemble them into log rafts, float them to the place you set, then have them disassembled for you to haul away. All I want from you is that you feed my crew. In this way Hiram supplied all the cedar and cypress timber that Solomon wanted. In his turn, Solomon gave Hiram 125,000 bushels of wheat and 115,000 gallons of virgin olive oil. He did this every year. And God, for his part, gave Solomon wisdom, just as he had promised. The healthy peace between Hiram and Solomon was formalized by a treaty. King Solomon raised a workforce of 30,000 men from all over Israel. He sent them in shifts of 10,000 each month to the Lebanon forest, they would work a month in Lebanon and then be at home two months. Adoniram was in charge of the work crew. Solomon also had 70,000 unskilled workers and another 80,000 stonecutters up in the hills, plus 3,300 foremen managing the project and supervising the work crews. Following the king's orders, they quarried huge blocks of the best stone, dressed stone for the foundation of the temple. Solomon and Hiram's construction workers, assisted by the men of Jebel, cut and prepared the timber and stone for building the temple. 480 years after the Israelites came out of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's rule over Israel, in the month of Ziv, the second month, Solomon started building the temple of God. The temple that King Solomon built to God was 90 feet long, 30 feet wide, and 45 feet high. There was a porch across the 30-foot width of the temple that extended out 15 feet. Within the temple he made narrow, deep-sealed windows. Against the outside walls he built a supporting structure in which there were smaller rooms, the lower floor was seven and a half feet wide, the middle floor nine feet, and the third floor ten and a half feet. He had projecting ledges built into the outside temple walls to support the buttressing beams. The stone blocks for the building of the temple were all dressed at the quarry so that the building site itself was reverently quiet, no noise from hammers and chisels and other iron tools. The entrance to the ground floor was at the south end of the temple, stairs led to the second floor and then to the third. Solomon built and completed the temple, finishing it off with roof beams and planks of cedar. The supporting structure along the outside walls was attached to the temple with cedar beams and the rooms in it were seven and a half feet tall. The word of God came to Solomon saying, About this temple you are building, what's important is that you live the way I have set out for you and do what I tell you, following my instructions carefully and obediently. 
Then I'll complete in you the promise I made to David your father. I'll personally take up my residence among the Israelites, I won't desert my people Israel. Solomon built and completed the temple. He paneled the interior walls from floor to ceiling with cedar planks, for flooring he used cypress. The thirty feet at the rear of the temple he made into an inner sanctuary, cedar planks from floor to ceiling, the Holy of Holies. The main sanctuary area in front was sixty feet long. The entire interior of the temple was cedar, with carvings of fruits and flowers. All cedar, none of the stone was exposed. The inner sanctuary within the temple was for housing the chest of the covenant of God. This inner sanctuary was a cube, thirty feet each way, all plated with gold. The altar of cedar was also gold-plated. Everywhere you looked there was pure gold, gold chains strung in front of the gold-plated inner sanctuary, gold everywhere, walls, ceiling, floor, and altar. Dazzling. Then he made two cherubim, gigantic angel-like figures, from olive wood. Each was fifteen feet tall. The outstretched wings of the cherubim, they were identical in size and shape, measured another fifteen feet. He placed the two cherubim, their wings spread, in the inner sanctuary. The combined wing spread stretched the width of the room, the wing of one cherub touched one wall, the wing of the other the other wall, and the wings touched in the middle. The cherubim were gold-plated. He then carved engravings of cherubim, palm trees, and flower blossoms on all the walls of both the inner and the main sanctuary. And all the floors of both inner and outer rooms were gold-plated. He constructed doors of olive wood for the entrance to the inner sanctuary, the lintel and doorposts were five-sided. The doors were also carved with cherubim, palm trees, and flowers, and then covered with gold leaf. Similarly, he built the entrance to the main sanctuary using olive wood for the doorposts but these doorposts were four-sided. The doors were of cypress, split into two panels, each panel swinging separately. These also were carved with cherubim, palm trees, and flowers, and plated with finely hammered gold leaf. He built the inner court with three courses of dressed stones topped with a course of plain cedar timbers. The foundation for God's temple was laid in the fourth year in the month of Ziv. It was completed in the eleventh year in the month of Bull, the eighth month, down to the last detail, just as planned. It took Solomon seven years to build it. It took Solomon another thirteen years to finish building his own palace complex. He built the palace of the forest of Lebanon a hundred and fifty feet long, seventy-five feet wide, and forty-five feet high. There were four rows of cedar columns supporting forty-five cedar beams, fifteen in each row, and then roofed with cedar. Windows and groupings of three were set high in the walls on either side. All the doors were rectangular and arranged symmetrically. He built a colonnaded courtyard 75 feet long and 45 wide. It had a roofed porch at the front with ample eaves. He built a courtroom, the Hall of Justice, where he would decide judicial matters, and paneled it with cedar. He built his personal residence behind the hall on a similar plan. Solomon also built another one just like it for Pharaoh's daughter, whom he had married. No expense was spared, everything here, inside and out, from foundation to roof was constructed using high-quality stone, accurately cut and shaped and polished. The foundation stones were huge, ranging in size from 12 to 15 feet, and of the very best quality. The finest stone was used above the foundation, shaped to size and trimmed with cedar. 
The courtyard was enclosed with a wall made of three layers of stone and topped with cedar timbers, just like the one in the porch of the Temple of God. King Solomon sent to Tyre and asked Hiram, not the king, another Hiram, to come. Hiram's mother was a widow from the tribe of Naphtali. His father was a Tyrian and a master worker in bronze. Hiram was a real artist, he could do anything with bronze. He came to King Solomon and did all the bronze work. First he cast two pillars in bronze, each 27 feet tall and 18 feet in circumference. He then cast two capitals in bronze to set on the pillars, each capital was seven and a half feet high and flared at the top in the shape of a lily. Each capital was dressed with an elaborate filigree of seven braided chains and a double row of two hundred pomegranates, setting the pillars off magnificently. He set the pillars up in the entrance porch to the temple, the pillar to the south he named Security, Jachin, and the pillar to the north Stability, Boaz. The capitals were in the shape of lilies. When the pillars were finished, Hiram's next project was to make the sea, an immense round basin of cast metal 15 feet in diameter, 7 and a half feet tall, and 45 feet in circumference. Just under the rim there were two bands of decorative gourds, ten gourds to each foot and a half. The gourds were cast in one piece with the sea. The sea was set on twelve bulls, three facing north, three facing west, three facing south, and three facing east, the bulls faced outward supporting the sea on their hindquarters. The sea was three inches thick and flared at the rim like a cup, or like a lily. It held about 11,500 gallons. Hiram also made ten washstands of bronze. Each was six feet square and four and a half feet tall. They were made like this, panels were fastened to the uprights. Lions, bulls, and cherubim were represented on the panels and uprights. Beveled wreathwork bordered the lions and bulls above and below. Each stand was mounted on four bronze wheels with bronze axles. The uprights were cast with decorative relief work. Each stand held a basin on a circular engraved support a foot and a half deep set on a pedestal two and a quarter feet square. The washstand itself was square. The axles were attached under the stand and the wheels fixed to them. The wheels were 27 inches in diameter, they were designed like chariot wheels. Everything, axles, rims, spokes, and hubs, was of cast metal. There was a handle at the four corners of each washstand, the handles cast in one piece with the stand. At the top of the washstand there was a ring about nine inches deep. The uprights and handles were cast with the stand. Everything in every available surface was engraved with cherubim, lions, and palm trees, bordered by arabesques. The washstands were identical, all cast in the same mold. He also made ten bronze washbasins, each six feet in diameter with a capacity of 230 gallons, one basin for each of the ten washstands. He arranged five stands on the south side of the temple and five on the north. The sea was placed at the southeast corner of the temple. Hiram then fashioned the various utensils, buckets and shovels and bowls. Hiram completed all the work he set out to do for King Solomon on the Temple of God. Two Pillars Two capitals on top of the pillars. Two decorative filigrees for the capitals. Four hundred pomegranates for the two filigrees. A double row of pomegranates for each filigree. Ten washstands each with its wash basin. One C. Twelve bulls under the sea. Miscellaneous buckets, shovels, 
and bowls. All these artifacts that Hiram made for King Solomon for the temple of God were of burnished bronze. He cast them in clay in a foundry on the Jordan plain between Sukkis and Zarethan. These artifacts were never weighed, there were far too many. Nobody has any idea how much bronze was used. Solomon was also responsible for all the furniture and accessories in the temple of God. The gold altar. The gold table that held the bread of the presence. The pure gold candelabras, five to the right and five to the left in front of the inner sanctuary. The gold flowers, lamps, and tongs. The pure gold dishes, wick trimmers, sprinkling bowls, ladles, and censers. The gold sockets for the doors of the inner sanctuary, the Holy of Holies, used also for the doors of the main sanctuary. That completed all the work King Solomon did on the Temple of God. He then brought in the items consecrated by his father David, the silver and the gold and the artifacts. He placed them all in the treasury of God's temple. Bringing all this to a climax, King Solomon called in the leaders of Israel, all the heads of the tribes and the family patriarchs, to bring up the chest of the covenant of God from Zion, the city of David. And they came, all Israel before King Solomon in the month of Ethanim, the seventh month, for the great autumn festival. With all Israel's leaders present, the priests took up the chest of God and carried up the chest and the tent of meeting and all the holy vessels that went with the tent. King Solomon and the entire congregation of Israel were there at the chest worshipping and sacrificing huge numbers of sheep and cattle, so many that no one could keep track. Then the priests brought the chest of the covenant of God to its place in the inner sanctuary, the Holy of Holies, under the wings of the cherubim. The outspread wings of the cherubim stretched over the chest and its poles. The poles were so long that their ends could be seen from the entrance to the inner sanctuary, but were not noticeable farther out. They're still there today. There was nothing in the chest but the two stone tablets that Moses had placed in it at Horeb where God made a covenant with Israel after bringing them up from Egypt. The temple finished, dedicated, filled. When the priests left the holy place, a cloud filled the temple of God. The priests couldn't carry out their priestly duties because of the cloud, the glory of God filled the temple of God. Then Solomon spoke. God has told us that he lives in the dark. Where no one can see him. I've built this splendid temple, O God. To mark your invisible presence forever. The king then turned to face the congregation and blessed them. Blessed be God, the God of Israel, who spoke personally to my father David. Now he has kept the promise he made when he said, From the day I brought my people Israel from Egypt, I haven't set apart one city among the tribes of Israel to build a temple to fix my name there. But I did choose David to rule my people Israel. My father David had it in his heart to build a temple honoring the name of God, the God of Israel. But God told him, It was good that you wanted to build a temple in my honor, most commendable. But you are not the one to do it, your son will build it to honor my name. God has done what he said he would do, I have succeeded David my father and ruled over Israel just as God promised and now I've built a temple to honor God, the God of Israel, and I've secured a place for the chest that holds the covenant of God, the covenant that he made with our ancestors when he brought them up from the land of Egypt. Before the entire congregation of Israel, Solomon took a position before the altar, spread his hands out before heaven, and prayed. O God, God of Israel, 
There is no God like you in the skies above or on the earth below who unswervingly keeps covenant with his servants and relentlessly loves them as they sincerely live in obedience to your way. You kept your word to David my father, your personal word. You did exactly what you promised, every detail. The proof is before us today. Keep it up, God, O God of Israel. Continue to keep the promises you made to David my father when you said, You'll always have a descendant to represent my rule on Israel's throne, on the condition that your sons are as careful to live obediently in my presence as you have. O God of Israel, let this all happen. Confirm and establish it. Can it be that God will actually move into our neighborhood? Why, the cosmos itself isn't large enough to give you breathing room, let alone this temple I've built. Even so, I'm bold to ask, pay attention to these my prayers, both intercessory and personal, O oh God, my God. Listen to my prayers, energetic and devout, that I'm setting before you right now. Keep your eyes open to this temple night and day, this place of which you said, my name will be honored there, and listen to the prayers that I pray at this place. Listen from your home in heaven. And when you hear, forgive. When someone hurts a neighbor and promises to make things right, and then comes and repeats the promise before your altar in this temple, listen from heaven and act accordingly, judge your servants, making the offender pay for his offense and setting the offended free of any charges. When your people Israel are beaten by an enemy because they've sinned against you, but then turn to you and acknowledge your rule in prayers desperate and devout in this temple. Listen from your home in heaven. Forgive the sin of your people Israel. Return them to the land you gave their ancestors. When the skies shrivel up and there is no rain because your people have sinned against you, but then they pray at this place, acknowledging your rule and quitting their sins because you have scourged them. Listen from your home in heaven. Forgive the sins of your servants, your people Israel. Then start over with them, train them to live right and well, send rain on the land you gave your people as an inheritance. When disasters strike, famine or catastrophe, crop failure or disease, locust or beetle, or when an enemy attacks their defenses, calamity of any sort, any prayer that's prayed from anyone at all among your people Israel, hearts penetrated by the disaster, hands and arms thrown out to this temple for help. Listen from your home in heaven. Forgive and go to work on us. Give what each deserves, for you know each life from the inside, you're the only one with such, inside knowledge, so that they'll live before you in lifelong reverent and believing obedience on this land you gave our ancestors. And don't forget the foreigner who is not a member of your people Israel but has come from a far country because of your reputation. People are going to be attracted here by your great reputation, your wonder-working power, who come to pray at this temple. Listen from your home in heaven. Honor the prayers of the foreigner so that people all over the world will know who you are and what you're like and will live in reverent obedience before you, just as your own people Israel do, so they'll know that you personally make this temple that I've built what it is. When your people go to war against their enemies at the time and place you send them and they pray to God toward the city you chose and this temple I've built to honor your name. Listen from heaven to what they pray and ask for. And do what's right for them. When they sin against you, and they certainly will, there's no one without sin, and in anger you turn them over to the enemy and they are taken captive to the enemy's land, whether far or near, but repent in the country of their captivity and pray with changed hearts in their exile, we've sinned, we've done wrong, we've been most wicked, and turn back to you heart and soul in the land of the enemy who conquered them, and pray to you toward their homeland, the land you gave their ancestors. 
toward the city you chose, and this temple I have built to the honor of your name. Listen from your home in heaven. To their prayers desperate and devout. And do what is best for them. Forgive your people who have sinned against you, forgive their gross rebellions and move their captors to treat them with compassion. They are, after all, your people and your precious inheritance whom you rescued from the heart of that iron-smelting furnace, Egypt. O oh, be alert and attentive to the needy prayers of me, your servant, and your dear people Israel, listen every time they cry out to you. You handpicked them from all the peoples on earth to be your very own people, as you announced through your servant Moses when you, O oh God, in your masterful rule, delivered our ancestors from Egypt. Having finished praying to God, all these bold and passionate prayers, Solomon stood up before God's altar where he had been kneeling all this time, his arms stretched upward to heaven. Standing, he blessed the whole congregation of Israel, blessing them at the top of his lungs. After Solomon had completed building the temple of God in his own palace, all the projects he had set his heart on doing, God appeared to Solomon again, just as he had appeared to him at Gibeon. And God said to him, I've listened to and received all your prayers, your ever so passionate prayers. I've sanctified this temple that you have built, my name is stamped on it forever, my eyes are on it and my heart in it always. As for you, if you live in my presence as your father David lived, pure in heart and action, living the life I've set out for you, attentively obedient to my guidance and judgments, then I'll back your kingly rule over Israel, make it a sure thing on a solid foundation. The same guarantee I gave David your father I'm giving you, you can count on always having a descendant on Israel's throne. But if you or your sons betray me, ignoring my guidance and judgments, taking up with alien gods by serving and worshipping them, then the guarantee is off, I'll wipe Israel right off the map and repudiate this temple I've just sanctified to honor my name. And Israel will become nothing but a bad joke among the peoples of the world. And this temple, splendid as it now is, will become an object of contempt, visitors will shake their heads, saying, whatever happened here? What's the story behind these ruins? Then they'll be told, the people who used to live here betrayed their God, the very God who rescued their ancestors from Egypt, they took up with alien gods, worshipping and serving them. That's what's behind this God-visited devastation. At the end of twenty years, having built the two buildings, the Temple of God and his personal palace, Solomon rewarded Hiram king of Tyre with a gift of twenty villages in the district of Galilee. Hiram had provided him with all the cedar and cypress and gold that he had wanted. But when Hiram left Tyre to look over the villages that Solomon had given him, he didn't like what he saw. He said, What kind of reward is this, my friend? Twenty backwoods hick towns. People still refer to them that way. This is all Hiram got from Solomon in exchange for four and a half tons of gold. This is the work record of the labor force that King Solomon raised to build the Temple of God, his palace, the defense complex, the Milo, the Jerusalem Wall, and the fortified cities of Hazer, Megiddo, and Gezer. Pharaoh king of Egypt had come up and captured Gezer, torched it, and killed all the Canaanites who lived there. He gave it as a wedding present to his daughter, Solomon's wife. So Solomon rebuilt Gezer. He also built Lower Beth Horon, Baleth, and Tamar in the desert, backcountry storehouse villages, and villages for chariots and horses. Solomon built widely and extravagantly in Jerusalem, in Lebanon, and wherever he fancied. The remnants from the original inhabitants of the land, Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, all non-Israelites, survivors of the holy wars, 
were rounded up by Solomon for his gangs of slave labor, a policy still in effect. But true Israelites were not treated this way, they were used in his army and administration, government leaders and commanders of his chariots and charioteers. They were also the project managers responsible for Solomon's building operations, 550 of them in charge of the workforce. It was after Pharaoh's daughter ceremonially ascended from the city of David and took up residence in the house built especially for her that Solomon built the defense complex, the Millo. Three times a year Solomon worshipped at the altar of God, sacrificing whole burnt offerings and peace offerings, and burning incense in the presence of God. Everything that had to do with the temple he did generously and well, he didn't skimp. And ships. King Solomon also built ships at Ezi and Geber, located near Elath in Edom on the Red Sea. Hiram sent seaworthy sailors to assist Solomon's men with the fleet. They embarked for Ophir, brought back 16 tons of gold, and presented it to King Solomon. The Queen of Sheba heard about Solomon and his connection with the name of God. She came to put his reputation to the test by asking tough questions. She made a grand and showy entrance into Jerusalem, camels loaded with spices, a huge amount of gold, and precious gems. She came to Solomon and talked about all the things that she cared about, emptying her heart to him. Solomon answered everything she put to him, nothing stumped him. When the Queen of Sheba experienced for herself Solomon's wisdom and saw with her own eyes the palace he had built, the meals that were served, the impressive array of court officials and sharply dressed waiters, the lavish crystal, and the elaborate worship extravagant with whole burnt offerings at the steps leading up to the Temple of God, it took her breath away. She said to the king, It's all true. Your reputation for accomplishment and wisdom that reached all the way to my country is confirmed. I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't seen it for myself, they didn't exaggerate. Such wisdom and elegance, far more than I could ever have imagined. Lucky the men and women who work for you, getting to be around you every day and hear your wise words firsthand. And blessed be God, your God, who took such a liking to you and made you king. Clearly, God's love for Israel is behind this, making you king to keep a just order and nurture a God-pleasing people. She then gave the king four and a half tons of gold, and also sack after sack of spices and expensive gems. There hasn't been a cargo of spices like that since that shipload the Queen of Sheba brought to King Solomon. The ships of Hiram also imported gold from Ophir along with tremendous loads of fragrant sandalwood and expensive gems. The king used the sandalwood for fine cabinetry in the Temple of God and the palace complex, and for making harps and dulcimers for the musicians. Nothing like that shipment of sandalwood has been seen since. King Solomon for his part gave the Queen of Sheba all her heart's desire, everything she asked for, on top of what he had already so generously given her. Satisfied, she returned home with her train of servants. Solomon received 25 tons of gold in tribute annually. This was above and beyond the taxes and profit on trade with merchants and assorted kings and governors. King Solomon crafted 200 body-length shields of hammered gold, seven and a half pounds of gold to each shield, and 300 smaller shields about half that size. He stored the shields in the house of the forest of Lebanon. The king built a massive throne of ivory accented with a veneer of gold. The throne had six steps leading up to it, its back shaped like an arch. The armrests on each side were flanked by lions. Lions, twelve of them, were placed at either end of the six steps. 
There was no throne like it in any of the surrounding kingdoms. King Solomon's chalices and tankards were made of gold and all the dinnerware and serving utensils in the house of the forest of Lebanon were pure gold, nothing was made of silver, silver was considered common and cheap. The king had a fleet of ocean-going ships at sea with Hiram's ships. Every three years the fleet would bring in a cargo of gold, silver, and ivory, and apes and peacocks. King Solomon was wiser and richer than all the kings of the earth, he surpassed them all. People came from all over the world to be with Solomon and drink in the wisdom God had given him. And everyone who came brought gifts, artifacts of gold and silver, fashionable robes and gowns, the latest in weapons, exotic spices, and horses and mules, parades of visitors, year after year. Solomon collected chariots and horses, 1400 chariots and 12,000 horses. He stabled them in the special chariot cities as well as in Jerusalem. The king made silver as common as rocks and cedar as common as the fig trees in the lowland hills. His horses were brought in from Egypt and Cilicia, specially acquired by the king's agents. Chariots from Egypt went for 15 pounds of silver and a horse for about 3 and 3 quarters pounds of silver. Solomon carried on a brisk horse trading business with the Hittite and Aramean royal houses. King Solomon was obsessed with women. Pharaoh's daughter was only the first of the many foreign women he loved, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite. He took them from the surrounding pagan nations of which God had clearly warned Israel, you must not marry them, they'll seduce you into infatuations with their gods. Solomon fell in love with them anyway, refusing to give them up. He had 700 royal wives and 300 concubines, a thousand women in all. And they did seduce him away from God. As Solomon grew older, his wives beguiled him with their alien gods and he became unfaithful, he didn't stay true to his God as his father David had done. Solomon took up with Ashtoreth, the whore goddess of the Sidonians, and Molech, the horrible god of the Ammonites. Solomon openly defied God, he did not follow in his father David's footsteps. He went on to build a sacred shrine to Chemosh, the horrible god of Moab, and to Molech, the horrible god of the Ammonites, on a hill just east of Jerusalem. He built similar shrines for all his foreign wives, who then polluted the countryside with the smoke and stench of their sacrifices. God was furious with Solomon for abandoning the God of Israel, the God who had twice appeared to him and had so clearly commanded him not to fool around with other gods. Solomon faithlessly disobeyed God's orders. God said to Solomon, Since this is the way it is with you, that you have no intention of keeping faith with me in doing what I have commanded, I'm going to rip the kingdom from you and hand it over to someone else. But out of respect for your father David I won't do it in your lifetime. It's your son who will pay, I'll rip it right out of his grasp. Even then I won't take it all, I'll leave him one tribe in honor of my servant David and out of respect for my chosen city Jerusalem. God incited Hadad, a descendant of the king of Edom, into hostile actions against Solomon. Years earlier, when David devastated Edom, Joab, commander of the army, on his way to bury the dead, massacred all the men of Edom. Joab and his army stayed there for six months, making sure they had killed every man in Edom. Hadad, just a boy at the time, had escaped with some of the Edomites who had worked for his father. Their escape route took them through Midian to Paran. They picked up some men in Paran and went on to Egypt and to Pharaoh king of Egypt, who gave Hadad a house, food, and even land. 
Pharaoh liked him so well that he gave him the sister of his wife, Queen Topanes, in marriage. She bore Hadad a son named Genubath who was raised like one of the royal family. Genubath grew up in the palace with Pharaoh's children. While living in Egypt, Hadad heard that both David and Joab, commander of the army, were dead. He approached Pharaoh and said, Send me off with your blessing, I want to return to my country. But why, said Pharaoh, why would you want to leave here? Hasn't everything been to your liking? Everything has been just fine, said Hadad, but I want to go home, give me a good send-off. Then God incited another adversary against Solomon, Rezan son of Eliada, who had deserted from his master, Hadadezer king of Zobah. After David's slaughter of the Arameans, Rezan collected a band of outlaws and became their leader. They later settled in Damascus, where Rezan eventually took over as king. Like Hadad, Rezan was a thorn in Israel's side all of Solomon's life. He was king over Aram, and he hated Israel. And then, the last straw, Jeroboam son of Nebat rebelled against the king. He was an Ephraimite from Zerida, his mother a widow named Zeruah. He served in Solomon's administration. This is why he rebelled. Solomon had built the outer defense system, the Milo, and had restored the fortifications that were in disrepair from the time of his father David. Jeroboam stood out during the construction as strong and able. When Solomon observed what a good worker he was, he put the young man in charge of the entire workforce of the tribe of Joseph. One day Jeroboam was walking down the road out of Jerusalem. Ahijah the prophet of Shiloh, wearing a brand new cloak, met him. The two of them were alone on that remote stretch of road. Ahijah took off the new cloak that he was wearing and ripped it into twelve pieces. Then he said to Jeroboam, Take ten of these pieces for yourself, this is by order of the God of Israel, see what I'm doing, I'm ripping the kingdom out of Solomon's hands and giving you ten of the tribes. In honor of my servant David and out of respect for Jerusalem, the city I especially chose, he will get one tribe. And here's the reason, he faithlessly abandoned me and went off worshipping Ashtoreth goddess of the Sidonians, Chemosh god of the Moabites, and Molech god of the Ammonites. He hasn't lived the way I have shown him, hasn't done what I have wanted, and hasn't followed directions or obeyed orders as his father David did. Still, I won't take the whole kingdom away from him. I'll stick with him through his lifetime because of my servant David whom I chose and who did follow my directions and obey my orders. But after that I'll remove the kingdom from his son's control and give you ten tribes. I'll leave one tribe to his son, to maintain a witness to my servant David in Jerusalem, the city I chose as a memorial to my name. But I have taken you in hand. Rule to your heart's content. You are to be the king of Israel. If you listen to what I tell you and live the way I show you and do what pleases me, following directions and obeying orders as my servant David did, I'll stick with you no matter what. I'll build you a kingdom as solid as the one I built for David. Israel will be yours. I am bringing pain and trouble on David's descendants, but the trials won't last forever. Solomon ordered the assassination of Jeroboam, but he got away to Egypt and found asylum there with King Shishak. He remained in exile there until Solomon died. The rest of Solomon's life and rule, his work and his wisdom, you can read for yourself in the Chronicles of Solomon. Solomon ruled in Jerusalem over all Israel for forty years. He died and was buried in the city of David his father. His son Rehoboam was the next king. 
Rehoboam traveled to Shechem where all Israel had gathered to inaugurate him as king. Jeroboam had been in Egypt, where he had taken asylum from King Solomon, when he got the report of Solomon's death he had come back. Rehoboam assembled Jeroboam and all the people. They said to Rehoboam, Your father made life hard for us, worked our fingers to the bone. Give us a break, lighten up on us and we'll willingly serve you. Give me three days to think it over, then come back, Rehoboam said. King Rehoboam talked it over with the elders who had advised his father when he was alive, What's your counsel? How do you suggest that I answer the people? They said, If you will be a servant to this people, be considerate of their needs and respond with compassion, work things out with them, they'll end up doing anything for you. But he rejected the counsel of the elders and asked the young men he'd grown up with who were now currying his favor, What do you think? What should I say to these people who are saying, Give us a break from your father's harsh ways, lighten up on us. The young Turks he'd grown up with said, These people who complain, your father was too hard on us, lighten up, well, tell them this, my little finger is thicker than my father's waist. If you think life under my father was hard, you haven't seen the half of it. My father thrashed you with whips, I'll beat you bloody with chains. Three days later Jeroboam and the people showed up, just as Rehoboam had directed when he said, Give me three days to think it over, then come back. The king's answer was harsh and rude. He spurned the counsel of the elders and went with the advice of the younger set, If you think life under my father was hard, you haven't seen the half of it. My father thrashed you with whips, I'll beat you bloody with chains. Rehoboam turned a deaf ear to the people. God was behind all this, confirming the message that he had given to Jeroboam son of Nebat through Ahijah of Shiloh. When all Israel realized that the king hadn't listened to a word they'd said, they stood up to him and said, Get lost, David. We've had it with you, son of Jesse. Let's get out of here, Israel, and fast. From now on, David, mind your own business. And with that, they left. But Rehoboam continued to rule those who lived in the towns of Judah. When King Rehoboam next sent out Adoniram, head of the workforce, the Israelites ganged up on him, pelted him with stones, and killed him. King Rehoboam jumped in his chariot and fled to Jerusalem as fast as he could. Israel has been in rebellion against the Davidic regime ever since. When the word was out that Jeroboam was back and available, the assembled people invited him and inaugurated him king over all Israel. The only tribe left to the Davidic dynasty was Judah. When Rehoboam got back to Jerusalem, he called up the men of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin, 180,000 of their best soldiers, to go to war against Israel and recover the kingdom for Rehoboam son of Solomon. At this time the word of God came to Shemaiah, a man of God, tell this to Rehoboam son of Solomon king of Judah, along with everyone in Judah and Benjamin and anyone else who is around, this is God's word, don't march out, don't fight against your brothers the Israelites, go back home, every last one of you, I'm in charge here. And they did it, they did what God said and went home. Jeroboam made a fort at Shechem in the hills of Ephraim, and made that his headquarters. He also built a fort at Penel. But then Jeroboam thought, it won't be long before the kingdom is reunited under David. As soon as these people resume worship at the Temple of God in Jerusalem, they'll start thinking of Rehoboam king of Judah as their ruler. They'll then kill me and go back to King Rehoboam. So the king came up with a plan, he made two golden calves. Then he announced, 
it's too much trouble for you to go to Jerusalem to worship. Look at these, the gods who brought you out of Egypt. He put one calf in Bethel, the other he placed in Dan. This was blatant sin. Think of it, people traveling all the way to Dan to worship a calf. And that wasn't the end of it. Jeroboam built forbidden shrines all over the place and recruited priests from wherever he could find them, regardless of whether they were fit for the job or not. To top it off, he created a Holy New Year festival to be held on the 15th day of the 8th month to replace the one in Judah, complete with worship offered on the altar at Bethel and sacrificing before the calves he had set up there. He staffed Bethel with priests from the local shrines he had made. This was strictly his own idea to compete with the feast in Judah, and he carried it off with flair, a festival exclusively for Israel, Jeroboam himself leading the worship at the altar. And then this happened, just as Jeroboam was at the altar, about to make an offering, a holy man came from Judah by God's command and preached, these were God's orders, to the altar, altar, altar. God's message. A son will be born into David's family named Josiah. The priests from the shrines who are making offerings on you, he will sacrifice, on you. Human bones burned on you. At the same time he announced a sign, this is the proof God gives, the altar will split into pieces and the holy offering spill into the dirt. When the king heard the message the holy man preached against the altar at Bethel, he reached out to grab him, yelling, arrest him. But his arm was paralyzed and hung useless. At the same time the altar broke apart and the holy offerings all spilled into the dirt, the very sign the holy man had announced by God's command. The king pleaded with the holy man, help me. Pray to your God for the healing of my arm. The holy man prayed for him and the king's arm was healed, as good as new. Then the king invited the holy man, join me for a meal, I have a gift for you. The holy man told the king, not on your life. You couldn't pay me enough to get me to sit down with you at a meal in this place. I'm here under God's orders, and he commanded, don't eat a crumb, don't drink a drop, and don't go back the way you came. Then he left by a different road than the one on which he had walked to Bethel. There was an old prophet who lived in Bethel. His sons came and told him the story of what the holy man had done that day in Bethel, told him everything that had happened and what the holy man had said to the king. Their father said, Which way did he go? His sons pointed out the road that the holy man from Judah had taken. He told his sons, Saddle my donkey. When they had saddled it, he got on and rode after the holy man. He found him sitting under an oak tree. He asked him, Are you the holy man who came from Judah? Yes, I am, he said. Well, come home with me and have a meal. Sorry, I can't do that, the holy man said. I can neither go back with you nor eat with you in this country. I'm under strict orders from God, don't eat a crumb, don't drink a drop, and don't come back the way you came. But he said, I am also a prophet, just like you. And an angel came to me with a message from God, bring him home with you, and give him a good meal. But the man was lying. So the holy man went home with him and they had a meal together. There they were, sitting at the table together, when the word of God came to the prophet who had brought him back. He confronted the holy man who had come from Judah, God's word to you, you disobeyed God's command, you didn't keep the strict orders your God gave you you came back and sat down to a good meal in the very place God told you, don't eat a crumb, don't drink a drop. For that you're going to die far from home and not be buried in your ancestral tomb. 
When the meal was over, the prophet who had brought him back saddled his donkey for him. Down the road away, a lion met him and killed him. His corpse lay crumpled on the road, the lion on one side and the donkey on the other. Some passers-by saw the corpse in a heap on the road, with the lion standing guard beside it. They went to the village where the old prophet lived and told what they had seen. When the prophet who had gotten him off track heard it, he said, It's the holy man who disobeyed God's strict orders. God turned him over to the lion who knocked him around and killed him, just as God had told him. The prophet told his sons, Saddle my donkey. They did it. He rode out and found the corpse in a heap in the road, with the lion and the donkey standing there. The lion hadn't bothered either the corpse or the donkey. The old prophet loaded the corpse of the holy man on his donkey and returned it to his own town to give it a decent burial. He placed the body in his own tomb. The people mourned, saying, A sad day, brother. After the funeral, the prophet said to his sons, When I die, bury me in the same tomb where the holy man is buried, my bones alongside his bones. The message that he preached by God's command against the altar at Bethel and against all the sex and religion shrines in the towns of Samaria will come true. After this happened, Jeroboam kept right on doing evil, recruiting priests for the forbidden shrines indiscriminately, anyone who wanted to could be a priest at one of the local shrines. This was the root sin of Jeroboam's government. And it was this that ruined him. At about this time Jeroboam's son Abijah came down sick. Jeroboam said to his wife, Do something. Disguise yourself so no one will know you are the queen and go to Shiloh. Ahijah the prophet lives there, the same Ahijah who told me I'd be king over this people. Take along ten loaves of bread, some sweet rolls, and a jug of honey. Make a visit to him and he'll tell you what's going on with our boy. Jeroboam's wife did as she was told, she went straight to Shiloh and to Ahijah's house. Ahijah was an old man at this time, and blind, but God had warned Ahijah, Jeroboam's wife is on her way to consult with you regarding her sick son, tell her this and this and this. When she came in she was disguised. Ahijah heard her come through the door and said, Welcome, wife of Jeroboam. But why the deception? I've got bad news for you. Go and deliver this message I received firsthand from God, the God of Israel, to Jeroboam, I raised you up from obscurity and made you the leader of my people Israel. I ripped the kingdom from the hands of David's family and gave it to you, but you weren't at all like my servant David who did what I told him and lived from his undivided heart, pleasing me. Instead you've set a new record in works of evil by making alien gods, tin gods. Pushing me aside and turning your back, you've made me mighty angry. And I'll not put up with it, I'm bringing doom on the household of Jeroboam, killing the lot of them right down to the last male wretch in Israel, whether slave or free. They've become nothing but garbage and I'm getting rid of them. The ones who die in the city will be eaten by stray dogs, the ones who die out in the country will be eaten by carrion crows. God's decree. And that's it. Go on home, the minute you step foot in town, the boy will die. Everyone will come to his burial, mourning his death. He is the only one in Jeroboam's family who will get a decent burial, he's the only one for whom God, the God of Israel, has a good word to say. Then God will appoint a king over Israel who will wipe out Jeroboam's family, wipe them right off the map, doomsday for Jeroboam. He will hit Israel hard, as a storm slaps reads about, he'll pull them up by the roots from this good land of their inheritance, weeding them out, 
and then scatter them to the four winds. And why? Because they made God so angry with Asherah sex and religion shrines. He'll wash his hands of Israel because of Jeroboam's sins, which have led Israel into a life of sin. Jeroboam's wife left and went home to Tirzah. The moment she stepped through the door, the boy died. They buried him and everyone mourned his death, just as God had said through his servant the prophet Ahijah. The rest of Jeroboam's life, the wars he fought and the way he ruled, is written in the chronicles of the kings of Israel. He ruled for twenty-two years. He died and was buried with his ancestors. Nadab his son was king after him. Rehoboam's son of Solomon was king in Judah. He was forty-one years old when he took the throne and was king for seventeen years in Jerusalem, the city God selected from all the tribes of Israel for the worship of his name. Rehoboam's mother was Naamah, an Ammonite. Judah was openly wicked before God, making him very angry. They set new records in sin, surpassing anything their ancestors had done. They built Eshira sex and religion shrines and set up sacred stones all over the place, on hills, under trees, wherever you looked. Worse, they had male sacred prostitutes, polluting the country outrageously, all the stuff that God had gotten rid of when he brought Israel into the land. In the fifth year of King Rehoboam's rule, Shishak king of Egypt made war against Jerusalem. He plundered the temple of God and the royal palace of their treasures, cleaned them out, even the gold shields that Solomon had made. King Rehoboam replaced them with bronze shields and outfitted the royal palace guards with them. Whenever the king went to God's temple, the guards carried the shields but always returned them to the guardroom. The rest of Rehoboam's life, what he said and did, is all written in the chronicles of the kings of Judah. There was war between Rehoboam and Jeroboam the whole time. Rehoboam died and was buried with his ancestors in the city of David. His mother was Naamah, an Ammonite. His son Abijah ruled after him. In the eighteenth year of the rule of Jeroboam son of Nebat, Abijah took over the throne of Judah. He ruled in Jerusalem three years. His mother was Makkah daughter of Absalom. He continued to sin just like his father before him. He was not true heart to God as his great-grandfather David had been. But despite that, out of respect for David, his God graciously gave him a lamp, a son to follow him and keep Jerusalem secure. For David had lived an exemplary life before God all his days, not going off on his own in willful defiance of God's clear directions, except for that time with Uriah the Hittite. But war continued between Abijah and Jeroboam the whole time. The rest of Abijah's life, everything he did, is written in the chronicles of the kings of Judah. But the war with Jeroboam was the dominant theme. Abijah died and was buried with his ancestors in the city of David. His son Asa was king after him. In the twentieth year of Jeroboam king of Israel, Asa began his rule over Judah. He ruled for forty-one years in Jerusalem. His grandmother's name was Makkah. Asa conducted himself well before God, reviving the ways of his ancestor David. He cleaned house, he got rid of the sacred prostitutes and threw out all the idols his predecessors had made. Asa spared nothing and no one, he went so far as to remove Queen Maka from her position because she had built a shockingly obscene memorial to the whore goddess Eshira. Asa tore it down and burned it up in the Kidron Valley. Unfortunately, he didn't get rid of the local sex and religion shrines. But he was well-intentioned, his heart was in the right place, in tune with God. 
All the gold and silver vessels and artifacts that he and his father had consecrated for holy use he installed in the temple. But through much of his reign there was war between Asa and Baasha king of Israel. Baasha king of Israel started it by building a fort at Ramah and closing the border between Israel and Judah so no one could enter or leave Judah. Asa took all the silver and gold that was left in the treasuries of the temple of God and the royal palace, gave it to his servants, and sent them to Ben-Hadad son of Taberman, the son of Hesian king of Aram, who was ruling in Damascus, with this message, Let's make a treaty like the one between our fathers. I'm showing my good faith with this gift of silver and gold. Break your deal with Baasha king of Israel so he'll quit fighting against me. Ben-Hadad went along with King Asa and sent out his troops against the towns of Israel. He attacked Ijin, Dan, Abel Beth Maka, and the entire region of Kinnereth, including Naphtali. When Baasha got the report he quit fortifying Ramah and pulled back to Tirzah. Then King Asa issued orders to everyone in Judah, no exemptions, to haul away the logs and stones Baasha had used in the fortification of Ramah and use them to fortify Geba in Benjamin and Mizpah. A full account of Asa's life, all the great things he did and the fortifications he constructed, is written in the chronicles of the kings of Judah. In his old age he developed severe gout. Then Asa died and was buried with his ancestors in the city of David. His son Jehoshaphat became king after him. Nadab son of Jeroboam became king over Israel in the second year of Asa's rule in Judah. He was king of Israel two years. He was openly evil before God, he followed in the footsteps of his father who both sinned and made Israel sin. Baasha son of Ahijah of the tribe of Issachar ganged up on him and attacked him at the Philistine town of Jibbethon while Nadab and the Israelites were doing battle there. Baasha killed Nadab in the third year of Asa king of Judah and became Israel's next king. As soon as he was king he killed everyone in Jeroboam's family. There wasn't a living soul left to the name of Jeroboam, Baasha wiped them out totally, just as God's servant Ahijah of Shiloh had prophesied, punishment for Jeroboam's sins and for making Israel sin, for making the God of Israel thoroughly angry. The rest of Nadab's life, everything else he did, is written in the chronicles of the kings of Israel. There was continuous war between Asa and Baasha king of Israel. In the third year of Asa king of Judah, Baasha son of Ahijah became king in Tirzah over all Israel. He ruled twenty-four years. He was openly evil before God, walking in the footsteps of Jeroboam, who both sinned and made Israel sin. The word of God came to Jehu son of Hanani with this message for Baasha, I took you from nothing, a complete nobody, and set you up as the leader of my people Israel, but you plotted along in the rut of Jeroboam, making my people Israel sin and making me seethe over their sin. And now the consequences, I will burn Baasha and his regime to cinders, the identical fate of Jeroboam son of Nebat. Baasha's people who die in the city will be eaten by scavenger dogs, carrion crows will eat the ones who die in the country. The rest of Baasha's life, the record of his regime, is written in the chronicles of the kings of Israel. Baasha died and was buried with his ancestors in Tirzah. His son Elah was king after him. That's the way it was with Baasha, through the prophet Jehu son of Hanani, God's word came to him and his regime because of his life of open evil before God and his making God so angry, a chip off the block of Jeroboam even though God had destroyed him. In the twenty-sixth year of Asa king of Judah, Elah son of Baasha began his rule. He was king in Tirzah only two years. 
One day when he was at the house of Arza the palace manager, drinking himself drunk, Zimri, captain of half his chariot force, conspired against him. Zimri slipped in, knocked Ela to the ground, and killed him. This happened in the 27th year of Asa king of Judah. Zimri then became the king. Zimri had no sooner become king than he killed everyone connected with Basha, got rid of them all like so many stray dogs, relatives and friends alike. Zimri totally wiped out the family of Basha, just as God's word delivered by the prophet Jehu had said, wages for the sins of Basha and his son Elah, not only for their sins but for dragging Israel into their sins and making the God of Israel angry with their stupid idols. The rest of Elah's life, what he said and did, is written in the chronicles of the kings of Israel. Zimri was king in Tirzah for all of seven days during the twenty-seventh year of the reign of Asa king of Judah. The Israelite army was on maneuvers near the Philistine town of Jibbethon at the time. When they got the report, Zimri has conspired against the king and killed him, right there in the camp they made Omri, commander of the army, king. Omri and the army immediately left Jibbethon and attacked Tirzah. When Zimri saw that he was surrounded and as good as dead, he entered the palace citadel, set the place on fire, and died. It was a fit end for his sins, for living a flagrantly evil life before God, walking in the footsteps of Jeroboam, sinning and then dragging Israel into his sins. As for the rest of Zimri's life, along with his infamous conspiracy, it's all written in the chronicles of the kings of Israel. After that the people of Israel were split right down the middle, half favored Tibni son of Jinnath as king, and half wanted Omri. Eventually the Omri side proved stronger than the Tibni side. Tibni ended up dead and Omri king. Omri took over as king of Israel in the 31st year of the reign of Asa king of Judah. He ruled for twelve years, the first six in Tirzah. He then bought the hill Samaria from Shemer for 150 pounds of silver. He developed the hill and named the city that he built Samaria, after its original owner Shemer. But as far as God was concerned, Omri lived an evil life, set new records in evil. He walked in the footsteps of Jeroboam son of Nebat, who not only sinned but dragged Israel into his sins, making God angry, such an empty-headed, empty-hearted life. The rest of Omri's life, the mark he made on his times, is written in the chronicles of the kings of Israel. Omri died and was buried in Samaria. His son Ahab was the next king after him. Ahab son of Omri became king of Israel in the thirty-eighth year of Asa king of Judah. Ahab son of Omri was king over Israel for twenty-two years. He ruled from Samaria. Ahab son of Omri did even more open evil before God than anyone yet, a new champion in evil. It wasn't enough for him to copy the sins of Jeroboam son of Nebat, no, he went all out, first by marrying Jezebel daughter of Ethbal king of the Sidonians, and then by serving and worshipping the god Baal. He built a temple for Baal in Samaria, and then furnished it with an altar for Baal. Worse, he went on and built a shrine to the sacred Hor Asherah. He made the God of Israel angrier than all the previous kings of Israel put together. It was under Ahab's rule that Heel of Bethel refortified Jericho, but at a terrible cost, he ritually sacrificed his firstborn son Abram at the laying of the foundation, and his youngest son Segub at the setting up of the gates. This is exactly what Joshua son of Nun said would happen. And then this happened, Elijah the Tishbite, from among the settlers of Gilead, confronted Ahab, as surely as God lives, the God of Israel before whom I stand in obedient service, 
the next years are going to see a total drought, not a drop of dew or rain unless I say otherwise. God then told Elijah, Get out of here, and fast. Head east and hide out at the Korath Ravine on the other side of the Jordan River. You can drink fresh water from the brook, I've ordered the ravens to feed you. Elijah obeyed God's orders. He went and camped in the Korath Canyon on the other side of the Jordan. And sure enough, ravens brought him his meals, both breakfast and supper, and he drank from the brook. Eventually the brook dried up because of the drought. Then God spoke to him, Get up and go to Zarephath in Sidon and live there. I've instructed a woman who lives there, a widow, to feed you. So he got up and went to Zarephath. As he came to the entrance of the village he met a woman, a widow, gathering firewood. He asked her, Please, would you bring me a little water in a jug? I need a drink. As she went to get it, he called out, and while you're at it, would you bring me something to eat? She said, I swear, as surely as your God lives, I don't have so much as a biscuit. I have a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a bottle, you found me scratching together just enough firewood to make a last meal for my son and me. After we eat it, we'll die. Elijah said to her, Don't worry about a thing. Go ahead and do what you've said. But first make a small biscuit for me and bring it back here. Then go ahead and make a meal from what's left for you and your son. This is the word of the God of Israel, the jar of flour will not run out and the bottle of oil will not become empty before God sends rain on the land and ends this drought. And she went right off and did it, did just as Elijah asked. And it turned out as he said, daily food for her and her family. The jar of meal didn't run out and the bottle of oil didn't become empty, God's promise fulfilled to the letter, exactly as Elijah had delivered it. Later on the woman's son became sick. The sickness took a turn for the worse, and then he stopped breathing. The woman said to Elijah, Why did you ever show up here in the first place, a holy man barging in, exposing my sins, and killing my son? Elijah said, Hand me your son. He then took him from her bosom, carried him up to the loft where he was staying, and laid him on his bed. Then he prayed, O oh God, my God, why have you brought this terrible thing on this widow who has opened her home to me? Why have you killed her son? Three times he stretched himself out full length on the boy, praying with all his might, God, my God, put breath back into this boy's body. God listened to Elijah's prayer and put breath back into his body, he was alive. Elijah picked the boy up, carried him downstairs from the loft, and gave him to his mother. Here's your son, said Elijah, alive. The woman said to Elijah, I see it all now, you are a holy man. When you speak, God speaks, a true word. A long time passed. Then God's word came to Elijah. The drought was now in its third year. The message, Go and present yourself to Ahab, I'm about to make it rain on the country. Elijah set out to present himself to Ahab. The drought in Samaria at the time was most severe. Ahab called for Obadiah, who was in charge of the palace. Obadiah feared God, he was very devout. Earlier, when Jezebel had tried to kill off all the prophets of God, Obadiah had hidden away a hundred of them in two caves, fifty in a cave, and then supplied them with food and water. Ahab ordered Obadiah, go through the country, locate every spring and every stream. Let's see if we can find enough grass to keep our horses and mules from dying. So they divided the country between them for the search, 
Ahab went one way, Obadiah the other. Obadiah went his way and suddenly there he was, Elijah. Obadiah fell on his knees, bowing in reverence, and exclaimed, Is it really you, my master Elijah? Yes, said Elijah, the real me. Now go and tell your boss, I've seen Elijah. Obadiah said, But what have I done to deserve this? Ahab will kill me. As surely as your God lives, there isn't a country or kingdom where my master hasn't sent out search parties looking for you. And if they said, We can't find him, we've looked high and low, he would make that country or kingdom swear that you were not to be found. And now you're telling me, go and tell your master Elijah's found. The minute I leave you the Spirit of God will whisk you away to who knows where. Then when I report to Ahab, you'll have disappeared and Ahab will kill me. And I've served God devoutly since I was a boy. Hasn't anyone told you what I did when Jezebel was out to kill the prophets of God, how I risked my life by hiding a hundred of them, fifty to a cave, and made sure they got food and water? And now you're telling me to draw attention to myself by announcing to my master, Elijah's been found. Why, he'll kill me for sure. Elijah said, As surely as God of the angel armies lives, and before whom I take my stand, I'll meet with your master face to face this very day. So Obadiah went straight to Ahab and told him. And Ahab went out to meet Elijah. The moment Ahab saw Elijah he said, So it's you, old troublemaker. It's not I who has caused trouble in Israel, said Elijah, but you and your government, you've dumped God's ways and commands and run off after the local gods, the Baals. Here's what I want you to do, assemble everyone in Israel at Mount Carmel. And make sure that the special pets of Jezebel, the 450 prophets of the local gods, the Baals, and the 400 prophets of the whore goddess Asherah, are there. So Ahab summoned everyone in Israel, particularly the prophets, to Mount Carmel. Elijah challenged the people, How long are you going to sit on the fence? If God is the real God, follow him, if it's Baal, follow him. Make up your minds. Nobody said a word, nobody made a move. Then Elijah said, I'm the only prophet of God left in Israel, and there are 450 prophets of Baal. Let the Baal prophets bring up two oxen, let them pick one, butcher it, and lay it out on an altar on firewood, but don't ignite it. I'll take the other ox, cut it up, and lay it on the wood. But neither will I light the fire. Then you pray to your gods and I'll pray to God. The God who answers with fire will prove to be, in fact, God. All the people agreed, a good plan, do it. Elijah told the Baal prophets, choose your ox and prepare it. You go first, you're the majority. Then pray to your God, but don't light the fire. So they took the ox he had given them, prepared it for the altar, then prayed to Baal. They prayed all morning long, O Baal, answer us. But nothing happened, not so much as a whisper of breeze. Desperate, they jumped and stomped on the altar they had made. By noon, Elijah had started making fun of them, taunting, call a little louder, he is a god, after all. Maybe he's off meditating somewhere or other, or maybe he's gotten involved in a project, or maybe he's on vacation. You don't suppose he's overslept, do you, and needs to be waked up? They prayed louder and louder, cutting themselves with swords and knives, a ritual common to them, until they were covered with blood. This went on until well past noon. They used every religious trick and strategy they knew to make something happen on the altar, but nothing happened, 
not so much as a whisper, not a flicker of response. Then Elijah told the people, Enough of that, it's my turn. Gather around. And they gathered. He then put the altar back together for by now it was in ruins. Elijah took twelve stones, one for each of the tribes of Jacob, the same Jacob to whom God had said, From now on your name is Israel. He built the stones into the altar in honor of God. Then Elijah dug a fairly wide trench around the altar. He laid firewood on the altar, cut up the ox, put it on the wood, and said, Fill four buckets with water and drench both the ox and the firewood. Then he said, Do it again, and they did it. Then he said, Do it a third time, and they did it a third time. The altar was drenched and the trench was filled with water. When it was time for the sacrifice to be offered, Elijah the prophet came up and prayed, O God, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, make it known right now that you are God in Israel, that I am your servant, and that I'm doing what I'm doing under your orders. Answer me, God, O answer me and reveal to this people that you are God, the true God, and that you are giving these people another chance at repentance. Immediately the fire of God fell and burned up the offering, the wood, the stones, the dirt, and even the water in the trench. All the people saw it happen and fell on their faces in awed worship, exclaiming, God is the true God. God is the true God. Elijah told them, Grab the Baal prophets. Don't let one get away. They grabbed them. Elijah had them taken down to the brook Kishon and they massacred the lot. Elijah said to Ahab, Up on your feet. Eat and drink, celebrate. Rain is on the way, I hear it coming. Ahab did it, got up and ate and drank. Meanwhile, Elijah climbed to the top of Carmel, bowed deeply in prayer, his face between his knees. Then he said to his young servant, On your feet now. Look toward the sea. He went, looked, and reported back, I don't see a thing. Keep looking, said Elijah, seven times if necessary. And sure enough, the seventh time he said, Oh yes, a cloud. But very small, no bigger than someone's hand, rising out of the sea. Quickly then, on your way. Tell Ahab, saddle up and get down from the mountain before the rain stops you. Things happen fast. The sky grew black with wind-driven clouds, and then a huge cloudburst of rain, with Ahab hightailing it in his chariot for Jezreel. And God strengthened Elijah mightily. Pulling up his robe and tying it around his waist, Elijah ran in front of Ahab's chariot until they reached Jezreel. Ahab reported to Jezebel everything that Elijah had done, including the massacre of the prophets. Jezebel immediately sent a messenger to Elijah with her threat, The gods will get you for this and I'll get even with you. By this time tomorrow you'll be as dead as any one of those prophets. When Elijah saw how things were, he ran for dear life to Beersheba, far in the south of Judah. He left his young servant there and then went on into the desert another day's journey. He came to a lone broom bush and collapsed in its shade, wanting in the worst way to be done with it all, to just die, enough of this, God. Take my life, I'm ready to join my ancestors in the grave. Exhausted, he fell asleep under the lone broom bush. Suddenly an angel shook him awake and said, Get up and eat. He looked around and, to his surprise, right by his head were a loaf of bread baked on some coals and a jug of water. He ate the meal and went back to sleep. The angel of God came back, shook him awake again, and said, Get up and eat some more 
you've got a long journey ahead of you. He got up, ate and drank his fill, and set out. Nourished by that meal, he walked forty days and nights, all the way to the mountain of God, to Horeb. When he got there, he crawled into a cave and went to sleep. Then the word of God came to him, So Elijah, what are you doing here? I've been working my heart out for the God of the angel armies, said Elijah. The people of Israel have abandoned your covenant, destroyed the places of worship, and murdered your prophets. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me. Then he was told, Go, stand on the mountain at attention before God. God will pass by. A hurricane wind ripped through the mountains and shattered the rocks before God, but God wasn't to be found in the wind, after the wind an earthquake, but God wasn't in the earthquake, and after the earthquake fire, but God wasn't in the fire, and after the fire a gentle and quiet whisper. When Elijah heard the quiet voice, he muffled his face with his great cloak, went to the mouth of the cave, and stood there. A quiet voice asked, So Elijah, now tell me, what are you doing here? Elijah said it again, I've been working my heart out for God, the God of the angel armies, because the people of Israel have abandoned your covenant, destroyed your places of worship, and murdered your prophets. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me. God said, Go back the way you came through the desert to Damascus. When you get there anoint Haziel, make him king over Aram. Then anoint Jehu son of Nimshi, make him king over Israel. Finally, anoint Elisha son of Shaphat from Abel Meholah to succeed you as prophet. Anyone who escapes death by Haziel will be killed by Jehu, and anyone who escapes death by Jehu will be killed by Elisha. Meanwhile, I'm preserving for myself seven thousand souls, the knees that haven't bowed to the god Baal, the mouths that haven't kissed his image. Elijah went straight out and found Elisha son of Shaphat in a field where there were twelve pairs of yoked oxen at work plowing, Elisha was in charge of the twelfth pair. Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak over him. Elisha deserted the oxen, ran after Elijah, and said, Please, let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, then I'll follow you. Go ahead, said Elijah, but, mind you, don't forget what I've just done to you. So Elisha left, he took his yoke of oxen and butchered them. He made a fire with the plow and tackle and then boiled the meat, a true farewell meal for the family. Then he left and followed Elijah, becoming his right-hand man. At about this same time Ben-Hadad king of Aram mustered his troops. He recruited in addition thirty-two local sheiks, all outfitted with horses and chariots. He set out in force and surrounded Samaria, ready to make war. He sent an envoy into the city to set his terms before Ahab king of Israel, Ben-Hadad lays claim to your silver and gold, and to the pick of your wives and sons. The king of Israel accepted the terms, as you say, distinguished lord, I and everything I have is yours. But then the envoy returned a second time, saying, on second thought, I want it all, your silver and gold and all your wives and sons. Hand them over, the whole works. I'll give you twenty-four hours, then my servants will arrive to search your palace and the houses of your officials and loot them, anything that strikes their fancy, they'll take. The king of Israel called a meeting of all his tribal elders. He said, look at this, outrageous. He's just looking for trouble. He means to clean me out, demanding all my women and children. And after I already agreed to pay him off handsomely, the elders, backed by the people, said, Don't cave in to him. Don't give an inch. So he sent an envoy to Ben-Hadad, 
Tell my distinguished Lord, I agree to the terms you delivered the first time, but this I can't do, this I won't do. The envoy went back and delivered the answer. Ben-Hadad shot back his response, May the gods do their worst to me, and then worse again, if there will be anything left of Samaria but rubble. The king of Israel countered, Think about it, it's easier to start a fight than end one. It happened that when Ben-Hadad heard this retort he was into some heavy drinking, boozing it up with the sheiks in their field shelters. Drunkenly, he ordered his henchmen, go after them. And they attacked the city. Just then a lone prophet approached Ahab king of Israel and said, God's word, have you taken a good look at this mob? Well, look again, I'm turning it over to you this very day. And you'll know, beyond the shadow of a doubt, that I am God. Ahab said, Really? And who is going to make this happen? God said, The young commandos of the regional chiefs. And who, said Ahab, will strike the first blow? God said, You. Ahab looked over the commandos of the regional chiefs, he counted 232. Then he assessed the available troops, 7,000. At noon they set out after Ben-Hadad who, with his allies, the 32 sheiks, was busy at serious drinking in the field shelters. The commandos of the regional chiefs made up the vanguard. A report was brought to Ben-Hadad, men are on their way from Samaria. He said, if they've come in peace, take them alive as hostages, if they've come to fight, the same, take them alive as hostages. The commandos poured out of the city with the full army behind them. They hit hard in hand-to-hand -hand combat. The Arameans scattered from the field, with Israel hard on their heels. But Ben-Hadad king of Aram got away on horseback, along with his cavalry. The king of Israel cut down both horses and chariots, an enormous defeat for Aram. Sometime later the prophet came to the king of Israel and said, On the alert now, build up your army, assess your capabilities, and see what has to be done. Before the year is out, the king of Aram will be back in force. Meanwhile the advisers to the king of Aram said, their God is a God of the mountains, we don't stand a chance against them there. So let's engage them on the plain where we'll have the advantage. Here's the strategy, remove each sheik from his place of leadership and replace him with a seasoned officer. Then recruit a fighting force equivalent in size to the army that deserted earlier, horse for horse, chariot for chariot. And we'll fight them on the plain were sure to prove stronger than they are. It sounded good to the king, he did what they advised. As the new year approached, Ben-Hadad rallied Aram and they went up to Afek to make war on Israel. The Israelite army prepared to fight and took the field to meet Aram. They moved into battle formation before Aram in two camps, like two flocks of goats. The plain was seething with Arameans. Just then a holy man approached the king of Israel saying, This is God's word, because Aram said, God is a god of the mountains and not a god of the valleys, I'll hand over this huge mob of an army to you. Then you'll know that I am God. The two armies were poised in a standoff for seven days. On the seventh day fighting broke out. The Israelites killed 100,000 of the Aramean infantry in one day. The rest of the army ran for their lives back to the city, Afek, only to have the city wall fall on 27,000 of the survivors. Ben-Hadad escaped into the city and hid in a closet. Then his advisors told him, Look, we've heard that the kings of Israel play by the rules, let's dress in old gunny sacks, carry a white flag of truce, 
and present ourselves to the king of Israel on the chance that he'll let you live. So that's what they did. They dressed in old gunny sacks and carried a white flag, and came to the king of Israel saying, Your servant Ben-Hadad said, Please let me live. Ahab said, You mean to tell me that he's still alive? If he's alive, he's my brother. The men took this as a good sign and concluded that everything was going to be all right, Ben-Hadad is most certainly your brother. The king said, Go and get him. They went and brought him back by chariot. Ahab said, I am prepared to return the cities that my father took from your father. And you can set up your headquarters in Damascus just as my father did in Samaria, I'll send you home under safe conduct. Then he made a covenant with him and sent him off. A man who was one of the prophets said to a bystander, Hit me, wound me. Do it for God's sake, it's his command. Hit me, wound me. But the man wouldn't do it. So he told him, because you wouldn't obey God's orders, as soon as you leave me a lion will attack you. No sooner had the man left his side than a lion met him and attacked. He then found another man and said, Hit me, wound me. That man did it, hit him hard in the face, drawing blood. Then the prophet went and took a position along the road, with a bandage over his eyes, waiting for the king. It wasn't long before the king happened by. The man cried out to the king, Your servant was in the thick of the battle when a man showed up and turned over a prisoner to me, saying, Guard this man with your life, if he turns up missing you'll pay dearly. But I got busy doing one thing after another and the next time I looked he was gone. The king of Israel said, You've just pronounced your own verdict. At that, the man ripped the bandage off his eyes and the king recognized who he was, one of the prophets. The man said to the king, God's word, because you let a man go who was under sentence by God, it's now your life for his, your people for his. The king of Israel went home in a sulk. He arrived in Samaria in a very bad mood. And then, to top it off, came this, Naboth the Jezreelite owned a vineyard in Jezreel that bordered the palace of Ahab king of Samaria. One day Ahab spoke to Naboth, saying, Give me your vineyard so I can use it as a kitchen garden, it's right next to my house, so convenient. In exchange I'll give you a far better vineyard, or if you prefer I'll pay you money for it. But Naboth told Ahab, not on your life. So help me God, I'd never sell the family farm to you. Ahab went home in a black mood, sulking over Naboth the Jezreelite's words, I'll never turn over my family inheritance to you. He went to bed, stuffed his face in his pillow, and refused to eat. Jezebel his wife came to him. She said, What's going on? Why are you so out of sorts and refusing to eat? He told her, Because I spoke to Naboth the Jezreelite. I said, Give me your vineyard, I'll pay you for it or, if you'd rather, I'll give you another vineyard in exchange. And he said, I'll never give you my vineyard. Jezebel said, Is this any way for a king of Israel to act? Aren't you the boss? On your feet. Eat. Cheer up. I'll take care of this, I'll get the vineyard of this Naboth the Jezreelite for you. She wrote letters over Ahab's signature, stamped them with his official seal, and sent them to the elders in Naboth city and to the civic leaders. She wrote, call for a fast day and put Naboth at the head table. Then seat a couple of stool pigeons across from him who, in front of everybody will say, You. You blasphemed God and the king. Then they'll throw him out and stone him to death. And they did it. 
The men of the city, the elders and civic leaders, followed Jezebel's instructions that she wrote in the letters sent to them. They called for a fast day and seated Naboth at the head table. Then they brought in two stool pigeons and seated them opposite Naboth. In front of everybody the two degenerates accused him, he blasphemed God and the king. The company threw him out in the street, stoned him mercilessly, and he died. When Jezebel got word that Naboth had been stoned to death, she told Ahab, Go for it, Ahab, take the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite for your own, the vineyard he refused to sell you. Naboth is no more, Naboth is dead. The minute Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, he set out for the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite and claimed it for his own. Then God stepped in and spoke to Elijah the Tishbite, On your feet, go down and confront Ahab of Samaria, king of Israel. You'll find him in the vineyard of Naboth, he's gone there to claim it as his own. Say this to him, God's word, what's going on here? First murder, then theft. Then tell him, God's verdict, the very spot where the dogs lapped up Naboth's blood, they'll lap up your blood, that's right, your blood. Ahab answered Elijah, my enemy. So, you've run me down. Yes, I've found you out, said Elijah. And because you've bought into the business of evil, defying God. I will most certainly bring doom upon you, make mincemeat of your descendants, kill off every sorry male wretch who's even remotely connected with the name Ahab. And I'll bring down on you the same fate that fell on Jeroboam son of Nebat and Baasha son of Ahijah, you've made me that angry by making Israel sin. As for Jezebel, God said, dogs will fight over the flesh of Jezebel all over Jezreel. Anyone tainted by Ahab who dies in the city will be eaten by stray dogs, corpses in the country will be eaten by carrion crows. Ahab, pushed by his wife Jezebel and in open defiance of God, set an all-time record in making big business of evil. He indulged in outrageous obscenities in the world of idols, copying the Amorites whom God had earlier kicked out of Israelite territory. When Ahab heard what Elijah had to say, he ripped his clothes to shreds, dressed in penitential rough burlap, and fasted. He even slept in coarse burlap pajamas. He tiptoed around, quiet as a mouse. Then God spoke to Elijah the Tishbite, Do you see how penitently submissive Ahab has become to me? Because of his repentance I'll not bring the doom during his lifetime. Ahab's son, though, will get it. They enjoyed three years of peace, no fighting between Aram and Israel. In the third year, Jehoshaphat king of Judah had a meeting with the king of Israel. Israel's king remarked to his aides, Do you realize that Ramoth Gilead belongs to us, and we're sitting around on our hands instead of taking it back from the king of Aram? He turned to Jehoshaphat and said, Will you join me in fighting for Ramoth Gilead? Jehoshaphat said, You bet. I'm with you all the way, my troops are your troops, my horses are your horses. He then continued, But before you do anything, ask God for guidance. The king of Israel got the prophets together, all four hundred of them, and put the question to them, should I attack Ramoth Gilead? Or should I hold back? Go for it, they said. God will hand it over to the king. But Jehoshaphat dragged his heels, Is there still another prophet of God around here we can consult? The king of Israel told Jehoshaphat, As a matter of fact, there is still one such man. But I hate him. He never preaches anything good to me, only doom, 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 Micaiah son of Imla. The king shouldn't talk about a prophet like that, said Jehoshaphat. 
So the king of Israel ordered one of his men, on the double. Get Micaiah son of Imla. Meanwhile, the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat were seated on their thrones, dressed in their royal robes, resplendent in front of the Samaria city gates. All the prophets were staging a prophecy performance for their benefit. Zedekiah son of Kanana had even made a set of iron horns, and brandishing them called out, God's word. With these horns you'll gore Aram until there's nothing left of him. All the prophets chimed in, yes. Go for Ramoth Gilead. An easy victory. God's gift to the king. The messenger who went to get Micaiah said, The prophets have all said yes to the king. Make it unanimous, vote yes. But Micaiah said, As surely as God lives, what God says, I'll say. With Micaiah before him, the king asked him, So Micaiah, do we attack Ramoth Gilead, or do we hold back? Go ahead, he said. An easy victory. God's gift to the king. Not so fast, said the king. How many times have I made you promise under oath to tell me the truth and nothing but the truth? All right, said Micaiah, since you insist. I saw all of Israel scattered over the hills. Sheep with no shepherd. Then God spoke, these poor people have no one to tell them what to do. Let them go home and do the best they can for themselves. Then the king of Israel turned to Jehoshaphat, See, what did I tell you? He never has a good word for me from God, only doom. Micaiah kept on, I'm not done yet, listen to God's word. I saw God enthroned and all the angel armies of heaven, standing at attention, ranged on his right and his left. And God said, How can we seduce Ahab into attacking Ramoth Gilead? Some said this, and some said that. Then a bold angel stepped out, stood before God, and said, I'll seduce him. And how will you do it, said God. Easy, said the angel. I'll get all the prophets to lie. That should do it, said God. On your way, seduce him. And that's what has happened. God filled the mouths of your puppet prophets with seductive lies. God has pronounced your doom. Just then Zedekiah son of Canana came up and punched Micaiah in the nose, saying, Since when did the Spirit of God leave me and take up with you? Micaiah said, You'll know soon enough, you'll know it when you're frantically and futilely looking for a place to hide. The king of Israel had heard enough, get Micaiah out of here. Turn him over to Ammon the city magistrate and to Josh the king's son with this message, king's orders, lock him up in jail, keep him on bread and water until I'm back in one piece. Micaiah said, if you ever get back in one piece, I'm no prophet of God. He added, when it happens, O oh people, remember where you heard it. The king of Israel and Jehoshaphat king of Judah attacked Ramoth Gilead. The king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, wear my kingly robe. I'm going into battle disguised. So the king of Israel entered the battle in disguise. Meanwhile, the king of Aram had ordered his chariot commanders, there were thirty-two of them, don't bother with anyone, whether small or great, go after the king of Israel and him only. When the chariot commanders saw Jehoshaphat they said, there he is. The king of Israel, and took after him. Jehoshaphat yelled out, and the chariot commanders realized they had the wrong man, it wasn't the king of Israel after all. They let him go. Just then someone, without aiming, 
shot an arrow randomly into the crowd and hit the king of Israel in the chink of his armor. The king told his charioteer, Turn back. Get me out of here, I'm wounded. All day the fighting continued, hot and heavy. Propped up in his chariot, the king watched from the sidelines. He died that evening. Blood from his wound pooled in the chariot. As the sun went down, shouts reverberated through the ranks, abandoned camp. Head for home. The king is dead. The king was brought to Samaria and there they buried him. They washed down the chariot at the pool of Samaria where the town whores bathed, and the dogs lapped up the blood, just as God's word had said. The rest of Ahab's life, everything he did, the ivory palace he built, the towns he founded, and the defense system he built up, is all written up in the chronicles of the kings of Israel. He was buried in the family cemetery and his son Ahaziah was the next king. Jehoshaphat son of Asa became king of Judah in the fourth year of Ahab king of Israel. Jehoshaphat was thirty-five years old when he became king and he ruled for twenty-five years in Jerusalem. His mother was Azuba daughter of Shilhai. He continued the kind of life characteristic of his father Asa, no detours, no dead ends, pleasing God with his life. But he failed to get rid of the neighborhood sex and religion shrines. People continued to pray and worship at these idolatrous shrines. And he kept on good terms with the king of Israel. The rest of Jehoshaphat's life, his achievements and his battles, is all written in the chronicles of the kings of Judah. Also, he got rid of the sacred prostitutes left over from the days of his father Asa. Edom was kingless during his reign, a deputy was in charge. Jehoshaphat built ocean-going ships to sail to Ophir for gold. But they never made it, they shipwrecked at Ezi and Jeber. During that time Ahaziah son of Ahab proposed a joint shipping venture, but Jehoshaphat wouldn't go in with him. Then Jehoshaphat died and was buried in the family cemetery in the city of David his ancestor. Jehoram his son was the next king. Ahaziah son of Ahab became king over Israel in Samaria in the seventeenth year of Jehoshaphat king of Judah. He ruled Israel for two years. As far as God was concerned, he lived an evil life, reproducing the bad life of his father and mother, repeating the pattern set down by Jeroboam son of Nebat, who led Israel into a life of sin. Worshipping at the Baal shrines, he made God, the God of Israel, angry, oh, so angry. If anything, he was worse than his father.